Hi everyone, I am really excited to interview Joseph Choma. He is the founder of Design Topology Lab and an associate professor of architecture at Clemson University. His research interests lie at the intersection of architecture, mathematics, folding, structure and materials. He is the author of three books, Morphing, a guide for mathematical transformations for architects and designers, Etude for architects and the philosophy of dumbness. So without much ado, we'll jump into the interview. So, Mr. Joseph, can you share us about your background and what inspired you to become an architect? Sure. So I guess like many students when they're in high school, you know, we're in a class, we're given this really thick textbook. And I learned very quickly in a lot of those classroom environments that the person who gets the highest grade in the class is the one who memorizes that textbook the best. I just, I don't know, I wasn't motivated by that. I didn't find that to be the best way of learning. But on the other hand, I did learn about a few other, or there was a few other methods of learning that I was exposed to as a, as a high school student. One of them was a science research program where for three years you kind of do your own independent research. So I had done it on active noise control with destructive interference and sound cancellation. And, and I thought that was amazing because I was actually creating knowledge. And it was really my own initiative where I was understanding the notion of an inquiry um, and then there was another thing I was exposed to I thought that was really amazing, which was something called the Technology Students Association, TSA. And we had a really lively chapter at our, at our town. I mean, there were some great volunteers. One of them, who was a volunteer, was a truly a master woodcarver. And he taught us both some principles of design, like formal competency, but also about projective geometry. So if you wanted to carve with a knife out of a block of wood, how you understand an elevation and a plan and how they combine, and then the steps you would take to essentially make double curvature. And it was just an amazing opportunity to be exposed to understanding 2D to 3D, craft, precision, and, and also this idea of kind of learning through making. And then, you know, I didn't really, wasn't sure exactly whether I wanted to do architecture for college, but I was interested in physics, civil engineering, and architecture. And then when I went to visit universities, I was so excited by the studio culture and seeing all this mess of stuff all over the place where you can see, you know, literally these students working through ideas, through drawings, models, and their computers were there. And uh, that kind of messy atmosphere of learning really excited me. And I, I didn't know what it was, but I was like, that's what I want to study. I want to, I want to dive into that atmosphere. So that's why I studied architecture. And you did your bachelor's at, at Rensselaer, Rensselaer Polytech Institute, Institute Master's at Master's MIT, at and PhD at University of Cambridge. Can you share some highlights of your journey from undergraduate to doctorate? Sure. The, so as an undergraduate student, I was, you know, a professor would give a brief of a project and a site and a program. I was always less interested in those briefs, and I was much more interested in the tools and methods we would use to design. And so I was really, again, I was, I was at that point obsessed with digital tools from parametric modeling to scripting to anything else that was out there. And also about how different software interfaces would change the way we, we thought through a design process or thought with that tool. So again, I was, I was really obsessed with how, not the design project, but how those tools were shaping the way I was approaching those design projects. And, you know, and I had some amazing mentors there. One in particular was also someone named Ted Kruger who essentially allowed me to be a research assistant at a young age. And then from there, when I went to MIT, I realized through the exposure of both with Ted Kruger of learning about design research, as well as my interest in tools, I thought MIT was the perfect place to learn more about computation. And at first I thought it was more about, okay, I'm gonna learn computer science and become an expert at coding and almost make my own software or make my own tools. And then when I was there, a few things happened. One is when I, when I took my first coding class, I realized that it's still a very hierar hierarchical heuristic, the way in which it's structured. And I realized that, you know, even if I wanted to modify that tool, I have to change that tool as well. And so it wasn't the most flexible framework, I guess, like a designer would like to work with. And so then I started getting interested at some point into fundamentals of just geometry and shapes. And so then I got interested in essentially mathematics and something called the Foyer series by Joseph Foyer from the 1800s. Where again, essentially, it was like a signal processing where you try to make any signal or any shape with just sine and cosine. And this was fascinating to me. I was blown away by this 
because to me, this was starting to become a transparent tool because if I change the equation, I change the shape and there's one to one. So it's not like most software, we click on buttons and it's a black box, we don't know what's under the buttons. Uh, or if we do know what's under the button, we can't manipulate what's under that button, we can only work with those buttons. And, and so I was really excited by that. I also had, a, you know, George Steiny was, was a big influence there as well, who's, you know, one of the creators of Shape Grammars. And in particular, his ideas about embedding, which is, you know, basically seeing beyond which is there. So visual calculation is different than symbolic calculation. So how do we go be, how do we, and that started making me think about how do I create tools or work with tools that give results that are less predictable? And that's where, again, the math was exciting because I was literally having a conversation with the math. I would change the equations. I would see what it happens. And eventually I start to understand it. And then eventually, you know, after I finished, you know, my studies at MIT, uh, I wrote my fir the first book, The Morphing Book, where I started to really document my very unique understanding of mathematics, and which is a truly designed understanding. And then, then I became a professor. And you know, so now I have an associate professorship at Clemson University. And actually, when I was still a tenure track faculty at Clemson, I actually started my PhD. So I did my PhD much later. It wasn't perfect sequence. And the reason for that was essentially I had just started to change gears from going from uh, this kind of notion of pure mathematics or pure geometry to really understanding how you translate that into things with material and structural constraints and construction logics. I had done a project in between on some stone carving with Parason as well as with Arup. And then I started getting interested in folding and in particular with fiberglass. And when I made that transition, that's when I realized, you know, this would be a great time to do a PhD as a way to essentially uh, reposition the work I've done into this new trajectory into foldable structures and materials. And so I decided to do it at the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Michael Ramage with the, also the advisor at Alan McRoby. And Clemson University was super supportive. They gave me a sabbatical to pursue that. And Cambridge was very supportive. I got a Cambridge International Scholarship uh, to fund it. So it was just an amazing journey. And I'm still in the very last writing phase of that, actually. But, but it really, I think, again, it, it was an opportunity to intellectually reframe the work I'm doing and the work I want to do moving forward. And yeah, so I mean, that's a little bit of some of that journey uh, in, in a nutshell. Can you talk about how, how does a typical day in your life look like? like? So a, a typical day uh, for me is, I don't know what, what typical is anymore with COVID-19. But so in addition to, so there's, my life is a bit compartmentalized. So on one hand, I'm a professor who teaches and I teach everything from freshmen all the way to PhD students. And then on the other hand, I'm someone who does my own research, which sometimes is in the format of a book. Sometimes it's more of an applied research, like a patent. And sometimes it's actually making physical things. And then I'm also a husband and a father of two daughters. So there's like the, the spectrum. And with, I think with COVID-19, those things have really compressed where so much is happening from my own home. I mean, even this interview was from the, the patio behind my house. And so, you know, the day to day can change. Uh, usually I wake up pretty early in the morning and uh, I, ha I start with a, an important, it's important for me to have my espresso, you know, alone and, and kind of digesting what the plan for the day is. And, and then that becomes an opportunity to really start working on anything. And usually I leave those morning you know, hours for my own research to um, really, when it's quiet in the house and my mind is clear, to essentially attack some aspect of that. Then during the day, it becomes very fluid where there might be a, a Zoom meetings, there, there might be teaching, there might be, you know, I might have to take care of my kids or cook for them. So there's all these things that kind of happen in the middle. And, and so to coordinate that uh, with my wife and with, with, you know, with them is, is always a challenge and it's always flexible. And then in the evening, I usually I make a decision in the evening whether I want to stay up really late. So if I want to stay up till 1 or 2 a.m. to again focus on research, or if I want to go to bed at a normal hour and then wake up very early the following day. So usually my schedule will kind of flip between uh, staying up really late or waking up very early. So I'll either stay up till one or two, or I might wake up at, I don't know, four or 5 a.m. and start working. 
because for me, those are the hours when it's, at least that during this COVID-19 scenario, when I can really just have the silence and the calmness to just focus on the research. And I think actually compartmentalizing is really important for me with that because you can't really multitask very well. So I think to try to do research while I'm taking care of a child doesn't really work, but I can compartmentalize where it's okay, now I'm gonna focus on my daughters. Now they're, they're okay. Now I can go focus on this. Now I'll focus on this. And so I think compartmentalizing works better than trying to do so many things just at once. But yeah, that's a little bit of a day in the life of, of me during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. okay. If you can name one book that had the biggest impact in your life, what would that be and why? So when I was an undergraduate student, I often went through the library and would look at a lot of books. And I don't know if it's as common now with uh, so, much, so much being accessible on the internet. But uh, back then, that was really the main access. And the one book that I remember in particular grabbing when I was there and really keeping for the whole year was a book by Eduardo Catalano called The Constant, Dialogues on Architecture in Black and White. And it's an amazing, well, Eduardo Catalano was an amazing architect, but it was an amazing book in the sense that it was a fictitious conversation between an architect and a mathematician. And, and then there was this, within the book, he's got beautiful drawings, uh, beautiful models, a lot of ruled surfaces in particular, but he also writes about the difference between a skin and bones mentality, which is how we normally think about architecture and structure, versus an idea of what, can we, what if we did it all with skin, which is more like a shell logic. And, and he was looking at it through a few different frameworks for that. But I found that to be extremely inspiring and I think that subconsciously definitely influenced me to get more inspired into mathematics. I'm also just to have a love for geometry. And, you know, later, you know, now living in the Southeast, you know, looking at his time that he spent at NC State, where he was the chair of that department or head of that department, and he did the Raleigh House uh, or, or Catalano House in Raleigh, uh, which was essentially a hyperbolic paraboloid, where he bent wood in two directions like a grid shell but like cross laminated them. And it was just, you know, it's, it was just like seeing the work that he did and the way in which he approached pedagogy in relation to that book, that whole thing I think is just amazing. Uh, but that would definitely be the book that stands out the most that influenced me very, you know, very young age. I see. I'll definitely add it to my reading list. Reading list. Can you share challenges faced in your career and how did you resolve it? Hmm. So I would say one of the biggest challenges of being in academics is you're not usually trained to teach or pedagogy. And so I think when I first started, I, I don't know, I think there was a notion of, there's a difference between teaching and making a student understand. So to me, the word to teach suggests in some ways to emulate. So if I do this, the student also does this. And so if kind of following a series of instructions, and I think that's part of an education, but it's not everything. A lot of it is about how do, you, how do you do as little as possible to make the student do as much as possible to get them to learn how to create their own understanding of something and to get them to learn how to become lifelong learners and be independent. And it's challenging. And I, at one point, I remember a colleague saying to me, and this is very early on when I was teaching, and, and he said, what are the learning objectives of doing that? And that question really kind of stayed with me because now I always, it's not about a project or a program, but it's always about what are the learning objectives and how do I hit those most fundamentally? And, and this is true for both, again, the PhD level all the way to the freshman level. So now instead of trying to teach, a lot of times I structure a course with more what I call pedagogical exercises, where they'll do an exercise, they'll learn something, they'll understand it, but then after they learn and understand it, they learn to take it and hold on to it and then apply it further. And uh, so there's a certain kind of rigor to that that I, that I like. There's a certain kind of combination of both teaching something and then allowing it to open up new possibilities. Uh, there's definitely a notion of how constraints can yield opportunities. And so I guess that's kind of a bit of the approach I do for pedagogy now. And it's still a work in progress and it always is. But I think that was definitely the biggest challenge early is just understanding that pedagogy is a design project and it's not so much about always the project as much as about how do you create an atmosphere or a sequence that teaches them to learn on their own and that's it's a challenge <laughs>
can you talk about can you talk about any mentor any or role mentor model role who role. made a significant contribution in your life yeah there's a, there's a lot i i think i've been really fortunate to interact with a lot of amazing people and so i don't think i can pick out one but i'll go through a few or a bunch i'll try to go through them quickly too but I mean, so I mean, early on, obviously, growing up, my parents were obviously a big influence. And I also grew up in a house with four other siblings where I was the youngest of the five kids. So obviously, my, my siblings had a big influence on my childhood. And then, you know, but then going on to college, you know, I mentioned Ted Kruger already, but he was a major influence on me and still is today, where he really used, he, he does something called designing epistemology is what he calls it, where again, he uses design as a means to create knowledge. And... Um, a project that I had done with him was on peripersonal space or the reach of the arm or the geometry defined by the reach of one's arm. And it was just an amazing opportunity to, to collaborate with him on that project and uh, learn how we gain a new understanding of something really through design methods. When I was also at, in my undergrad, there was an engineer named Bruce Danziger who was a named visiting professor who's at Arup in Los Angeles. And uh, he was also just extraordinary where he showed me and demonstrated not technical aspects of structures, although there was some technical aspects, but more so how structures and structural engineering can be a design device, how things can be structurally derived in a design approach. So we use structures as a design tool. And that was really fascinating because he was really more of a designer, I think, than an engineer, although he is a structural engineer and an amazing one at that. And I would say the third one in the undergrad would be a guy named uh, Andrew Saunders, who's really taught me a lot about formal competency and about you know how to use rules to essentially generate iterations. Then when I went to MIT, I was a teaching assistant for Nader Tirani, and he's probably the person who made me want to become a professor. He was doing all these competitions all over the world, you know, in Toronto and Australia. And then I remember you know him going to the studio when I was his TA. Uh, it was late. It might have been I don't know 10, 11 p.m. something like that. He had just gotten back, and he was tired. But he sat down in that chair and he 100% focused on those students. And it was just so inspiring to see this individual who, again, like this idea of compartmentalizing one's life, where when you're one-on-one -on -one with that student, you are one-on-one -on -one with that student. Everything else doesn't exist at that moment. And that kind of personal attention he gave to students, I think it's really what, what inspired me to want to become a professor. And then um, probably the last person at MIT that was a big influence was George Steiny. And again, the way in which he challenged uh, symbolic calculation with visual calculation, there was so much, there's so much there that to digest. And it's so much more than just combining combinatorics or combining elements that that really transformed my understanding of what computation is, or even just the notion that computation, it doesn't mean the computer. It, it just means using rules, parameters, constraints, and working within that framework of calculating. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that. And then, then later, at, at, you know, for my PhD studies, you know, Michael Ramage has been amazing. And one of the things about Michael is most people, when they're academics, they, they focus on research. They're really interested just in the intellectual discourse. The difference from Michael is he's also just interested fundamentally in making the world a better place. So when he does, works with natural materials, it's because he believes it's better for the environment than for the world. When he works with a community in need and develops a project for them, instead of it just being a proof of concept, it's because he wants to help that community in need. And, there's, and then he's also a, you know, a father of four daughters. And so, I mean, there's a certain kind of balance that he does there. And I think it's just extraordinary. And he's got his own practice, while, which he's a partner of. He's got a research center, which has collaborators in biology, engineering, all over. And then he, you know, then he also teaches. And so there's the way in which he lives his life in multiple dimensions, both intellectually as well as ethically, I think is just super inspiring. And so I don't know, I mean, that's, that's, there's, I could keep going, but I think that gives a certain spectrum, but I've been really, I just want to emphasize, I've been really fortunate to have these kind of direct engagements with these individuals that are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And now we will um, move to our next section next in section which, uh, in which uh, we'll get to know about your professional work. So can you share your definition of good design? So there's a little book by Bruno Minari called Good Design. I don't know if you know this one. It's only about, you know, yay big and it's got an orange on the cover. And it's a, I think it's an amazing book. He, when he talks about good design, he, he one of the 
the things he talks about is an orange. And he right, relates it, I think, to modernism with this idea that every single aspect of the orange is contributing to some other aspect. So this idea of part to whole relationships being interlinked. And I don't know, I think, and although he relates it a bit more to function, I think that's really is a, an amazing definition of good design. I don't think it has to be exactly function driven, but I think the notion that uh, again, how each part is contributing to the greater whole is super important. Sometimes I might call that a building or a design that's didactic, where it's almost, you can almost read it as a diagram of what the idea is. And I, again, it doesn't mean, to me, it doesn't mean that it has to be purely in the modernist sense, where everything is contributing to the function, but it could also be related to some kind of conceptual idea. But again, there, there is a point when something becomes extraneous or extra, and I think a really good design, there's nothing extraneous or extra. They're all, you know, they're all in conversation with each other and they're all contributing. So I think that's, yeah, for me, that's, the, that's what's good design. Can you share your design philosophy? philosophy? Sure. I think my design philosophy is just uh, design is rigorous play in a lot of cases. I think sometimes, you know, there, there's a notion of, you know, we need to have a big idea in order to start a project. I don't think we do. I think you could, but I think you don't need to. So like in science, you know, they sometimes say you need a hypothesis and then you do something. But on the other hand, you could also just do something. And then the act of doing something might yield some idea. And, and then if you're aware of, if you're, I guess if you're looking closely at what you're doing and how you're reflecting on it or how you're evaluating it, eventually there will be an idea, I think, or some concept. So I think that's the most, and I think this idea of the concept driven or tool driven I think usually in architecture or design, they're more blurred than distinct as well. Because what happens if you do, do a, have an idea or a hypothesis and you test it and it fails? You have to come up with a new idea or a new hypothesis. And so uh, that's what I think. I think design is really rigorous play. It's just constantly looking for new opportunities and the most number of possible opportunities. And uh, yeah, and, and just uh, being open to the unexpected. Can you give us an overview about, overview about the projects you did till you date? Till and and some key highlights? Sure. So I guess my, if I was to do a big kind of spectrum of it, I first, some of the earlier stuff, and I'll start, I'll say earlier when I was a grad student at MIT and then kind of to date, I was interested in, you know, again, mathematics and very much specifically in how I can understand it as a transparent tool and a design tool. And for that, there was a sequence that I went through where I first just played with it, and then eventually through playing with equations and seeing what the results are, that tacit exploration started giving me some explicit results. So I started documenting, oh, if I place this inside of a recursion of sine, I flatten a shape, something like that. Anyhow, so I did that, and then, and then I went through a series of frameworks, first understanding fundamental ways of transforming shapes, how you can combine transformations, and then how you can combine parts of shapes. After that, I started to become interested in how I could take this very unique understanding which I developed, uh, kind of bizarre understanding of math, and then trying to see how can I apply that to essentially understand architecture. So then I start analyzing existing buildings with math and recreating them, and then I would go back to the most basic, I would say like topological ancestor, so it might be just a sphere or a dome or a barrel vault, and then I transform it into a, a geometry that is a diagram of that building. And then from there, I would then look at a series of variations beyond that building. So this idea that the analytical process can also be generative or the precedent can also be generative. And then while I was doing that book, I was also making these really big giant drawing installations. And I was interested in this, this notion of how we perceive spatial boundaries. And I was also, it was kind of also a therapeutic thing to do while I'm working on that morphing book to just make things that are, are large. They have a certain kind of perceptual illusion and they were fun. And so, so I was interested in at that moment a lot about perception and they were probably related also to ideas uh, of aesthetics and, you know, and boundaries and atmosphere. You know, what is it like to have more of a noisy background that's still background rather than an object or maybe the difference between object and atmosphere was also an interest of mine. And then after that, I got an opportunity to do some work with stone carving. So Jim Durham, the owner of Porra Stone, he had picked up my book, I believe it was in Portland. And he contacted me, reached out to me, and we said, said, let's do a project together. And so then I started getting interested in that conversation. It was perfect timing because it was just when I was starting to get really interested in this notion of how do 
translate these abstract shapes to geometries that actually uh, deal with material and structural constraints. So we had worked on a project together with, uh, again, Bruce Danzinger at Arup with Alan Olson. They were the engineers who came and collaborated. And so we started working on a friction fit uh, geometry where it was six pieces that were all connected and they're all double curvature, stone carved pieces. And, and, but they're only connected through this kind of mortise and tendon connection, no adhesive. And then from there, I then got invited at some point to do something called the Composites Challenge by the American Composites Manufacturers Association. And, and that led me to essentially doing some research with foldable composites. And then once I uh, invented a technique to essentially fold fiberglass, then I started really, it all opened up like, wow, there's so many things that I can do with folding that can transform the way we build. And so that kind of opened up a lot of the trajectories that I'm doing today. Walking through one of your project in detail. Well, I guess I can talk about, maybe with just like the, the fiberglass as an example. When I was folding the fiberglass, you know, the, when I first got, approached that project, and I'm calling that project not a project like in the sense of an architect designing a building, but more of a research project, it was really about how do I challenge the notion that FRP materials, fiber reinforced polymers, are made. So typically, almost all parts are made with a mold. And it was started out with a critique of the SF MoMA expansion by Snohetta and fabricated by Chrysler Associates which is a really amazing expansion. I mean, it, I, I critique it, but it made major advancements in fireproofing technology. It's the largest implementation of FRP materials in the US. But for me, the part that really bothered me was that they used 710 unique molds to make 710 parts. And that idea that if you want to do something mass customized or bespoke, molds just don't make sense. You know, you, if you does make a mold really well, you can use it over a thousand times easily. So to me, this idea that you're gonna use it only to use it once or make it to only use it once doesn't make sense. And so that was the first part. And then the other thing was all things with FRP materials at that moment in time were about cladding or uh, Apple K and not so much about structural applications. And I thought that was kind of a missed opportunity, uh, especially since they have such a great strength to weight ratio. And maybe it's not for all structures, but maybe for certain kinds of structures, it's very appropriate. And so those were the two are big things. And then maybe the last thing that was a big contributor to start the framework for that was in Stuttgart, they had just done this extraordinary proof of concept project with fiberglass and carbon fiber, where they were using weaving as a technique with robotic arms and drones. And I thought it was a fantastic ex example of not using a mold. Um, but for me, it was also an example of a very high tech methodology. So they're using robotic arms and drones. And, I, and a lot of times in, in articles online, it's always these high-tech futures, you know, robotic fabrication, artificial intelligence, added manufacturing, self-assembly, something, I don't know. And, they're, and they're, they are futures and they're amazing. But I started to really wonder, you know, is there a way we can develop something that's very low-tech, that hasn't been thought of, that is also becomes, the reason it's also low-tech is because it becomes accessible to anyone in the world. Anyone can do it. And, and so then I, for the, for the folding of the fiberglass, I started thinking about shirt collars and how they used to starch collars. And I don't know if they still starch collars, but they used to at least. And, and then I also started thinking about like fabric hinges. So sometimes in furniture, they'll put fabric, you know, either laminated with wood or something else, and they use it as a simple hinge technique. And that led to this idea of, well, why don't we just put some painter's tape on there as a mask, paint on the resin and see what happens. And it worked out really well. Yeah, to my surprise, it worked really well as far as creating a flexible hinge. So then that led to a very rigorous exploration of kind of selective coating to make a really low-tech way of making a foldable composite that can be really, you know, scaled up quite large. And if you need to add material thickness, you just kind of laminate more material on top of it. And then, you know, and then, you know, the project goes on from there. But I guess it really started with this very critical observation and reflection on what was the status quo was today. And then challenging everything and not being afraid to fail. What was your design approach, challenges faced in one of your projects, and final output? Well, I guess for, so for a very specific design project, maybe a way of looking at it might be they all had different, they all had different challenges at different moments in time. So sometimes it was just to try to see if something could be done. So I think a lot of the work with fiberglass, it's more about 
seeing what new possibilities exist. With the stone project, that's probably got a more clear, linear process that I could describe in relationship to the question. And that's the stone project, you know, we, we started with more of a geometry that I developed where I was turning a dome inside out. And then after I was turning the dome inside out, then it looked like a logic, a structure that was very structural intuitively because of all the structural depth it got from the twisting and the peeling apart. And it still had a certain kind, it had a combination of both anti-classic curvature and syn-classic curvature, um, but it didn't follow, follow any of the kind of canonical models of, you know, a catenary base or funicular based geometries. And then, so then the next part of the challenge was, well, is it possible to fabricate something like this with, with robotic stone carving? And so we just took a chunk of it and we tried carving it. And this was done with Clara Stone Company. And, and these are really relatively thin. And so, you know, you're looking at a, a, something of a thickness of about an inch, you know, that's doing double curvature with stone. And then from there, you know, so we took the part that has this kind of twisted saddle and we carved that first because we said, well, that's the most challenging to carve. What is, happens with that? No problems at all with the carving of that. And then it was really about looking at the structure. And one, one of the constraints with the structure was stone in general, there's a certain dimension based on weight that is essentially convenient to ship on a truck. And then there's a certain point when the stone becomes so large that it's, it's you can do it, but it's not ideal. So that kind of geometric boundary con condition was smaller than the scope of the whole structure that we were envisioning. So I started to split it up into six pieces, but then what became interesting in dialogue with the structural engineers, especially with Bruce, was that you know it, we could just find a way of structuring it in a more traditional way. With you know we could add steel or or something else, but we were really interested in the purity of it, the geometry in relationship to the purity of something like Stonehenge, where it's just stone on stone. You know how can we be as primitive with the connection? Primitive in the sense it's it's really just stone, nothing else added and make the seams do as much for us as possible. And then when we were looking at how we were cutting some of the boundaries of those, or discretizing it, the way in which I designed it was that the four outermost points were anchored to the ground, but the, when they were all placed together, they would lock all together like a three-dimensional puzzle. And what, what that did was that it, it allowed, and since they're friction joints that are just kind of mortise and tenon like this, or maybe it's rounded edge with you know, going like this, it allowed compression to basically pass through the structure. So globally, it's only compression, but tension couldn't pass through those joints. But what, what people don't realize with stone is actually stone itself actually has a fairly high tensile strength, especially the stone we were looking at, which was a Valder stone. And uh, so the stone can take quite a bit of tension, but the global geometry didn't have to. Globally, it was only working as compression only. So it became this really odd compression only structure that didn't fit what we think of as a compression only, because if you were to look at the analysis, you say, well, there's there's actually you know, tension over there, but then you would see the tension switching like this because it doesn't cross over. It just kind of pops in a different location for the next panel. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it was a really amazing journey to kind of go through that. And I think one of the big challenges in the very end was, you know, unfortunately for the, the clients we were working with, there were certain budgetary cuts where the project didn't get realized in full scale. So I think that, and that was kind of a challenge that we just couldn't, you know, nothing we could do. Unfortunately, we didn't have, we weren't given an opportunity to change the scope of the project. So that's why it didn't get fully physically realized. But I think that the way in which we had to kind of change our framework as we were starting to engage, especially with how we discretized, I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wish you would have done differently in any of your projects? Uh, not so much in that uh, for me, when I look at my projects, they're all, it's kind of all one project. So like the word design can be a noun or a verb. You know, design is, this is a thing that's been designed or design is a process. And I think when you are looking at something you've done yourself, it's always both simultaneously because you see the thing, you can evaluate it as a thing. But on the other hand, your process of evaluating is also a continuation of that process. So I know, um, you know, like when I was doing, even now when I lecture on my work, sometimes I'll, I'll show some work I do with sketching with mathematics and I'll show a shape that I designed with math, but then I'll critique it and say, just because we can build it with our current means and methods doesn't mean we should. And so the way in which one critiques the work that they did basically projects the next work you do. And, uh, and I think the same thing is true for, you know, the, the folding of the fiberglass. You know, when I first was folding fiberglass, 
I was kind of a bit naive about the tolerance and the calibration of the width of the hinges. And so I started giving myself actually too much flexibility. And then I realized I actually have to calibrate it very precisely. But then there was also questions that just would arise like, well, I did it with straight creases. Can, cur can I do it with curved creases? So then I did it with curved creases. I said, wow, I can actually fold it with curved creases. That's amazing. And it was the first time fiberglass had ever been folded with curved creases in the world. But then once I did that, then it was not just I can do it with curved creases, but what are, what are curved creases good for? And then it sort of opened up all these other trajectories of how you know, curved creases start to work like bistable structures where they pop into place. They can have actually strength for uh, hydrostatic pre for resisting hydrostatic pressure because of their mechanical properties or the mechanical mechanism within them. And so there's all this other kind of performance embedded in there that I never thought about. If I didn't just first ask the question of, can I do it with curves? But now there's all this kind of rigor and calibration with seeing the possibility as curve, curve crease folding for architecture and engineering applications. So I don't know, I think it's just kind of, I think that's just the process is, I look at it all as kind of a continuous one project that I keep constantly reflecting on, repositioning, moving forward. And what is one what thing is, you want you readers want to, to take to away take from your book, Morphing a Guide for, of, to Mathematical Transformations for Architects and Designers and Etude for Architects? So I think for the Morphing book, fundamentally I'd like people to see it as just uh, an approach to design research. And I think that approach could be applied to a lot of things, not just math. So if you don't look specifically at just the math, but the way in which I was approaching using design to create knowledge and the way in which different frameworks built off of one another, and there's a certain kind of rigor behind it with really understanding how different combinations work. That's, and again, I think that could be applied to any discipline. And I think also at the end of the book where I start to use an analytical process as a generative tool, I think that's applicable to freshmen, to anybody, you know, PhD students. This idea that we don't design in a vacuum, but we design in conversation with work done in the past, you know, that it's an intellectual discourse that builds on itself. Uh, I think that's a really important leap there it's for anyone to take away. And then the Etude for Architecture book, I think, um, so for Etude for Architects, that was really geared originally more towards first or second year architecture students. And so part of it was about teaching them this idea that design is rigorous play or, or rigorous, iterative, reflective process. And I do that through computational thinking where they learn about uh, rules and constraints as generative devices and how it could be done with the computer or without the computer. So this idea that you can go back and forth between analog and digital. And I think probably the part that's most important there is for them to realize that depending what framework you use to design will influence a set of results. So if I'm folding a sheet of paper, that'll yield one plus set of possibilities. While if I uh, use sticks to make rolled surface, it will yield a very different set of possibilities. And I think the other part to take away from that is just this idea that we have to always look at things through a little bit of a lens of some abstraction, where if we're constantly re-looking at what we're looking at, we might see new possibilities. And I think so there's a certain, this idea that there are drawings to think with or objects to think with is really important. So. Yeah, that's, that's some hopes that people would take away from both of those books. Mm -hmm. And what was ma a major challenge in writing those books? Well, the, the Morphing book was, that was the first book I had ever done. And so it was a challenge just doing a book. And this notion that a book is also a project. And I think the other thing, the thing I was challenging with it was, when I first was proposing the book, especially when I was proposing the book with the analyzing chapter, and I said I was going to analyze some buildings, and I said which buildings I was going to analyze, I actually didn't know how to make those buildings yet. And so there was a real ch intellectual challenge of, uh, of not yet knowing before starting the project all the knowledge that was needed for the book. So it wasn't a process of just writing the book. I was actually creating the knowledge as I was writing the book. And so the book became a lens to document the recording of that. And so I think that was a real challenge and it was a long project. It was three or four years long in the making. And the, the other book, the A2 for Architects book, I mean, that one was a bit different because it's, it's really was more about sharing my approach to pedagogy, especially for foundation level students. And so I, I think it was a lot easier of a book to do. Although I think there were certain parts of it that were challenging. 
So I think the introductory essay of how I contextualize this kind of body of research or this body of teaching within a larger discourse of pedagogy that was a challenge for me because we have a habit of kind of just looking kind of like a myopic lens of this is what I do and not really looking at it in a larger context sometimes. And then I guess for the other thing with that book was just to make sure that the language for the A2 book stayed as simple as possible. I really wanted it to be where anyone could read, even a non-architect, and they could understand it. So I really tried to get rid of a lot of kind of architectural jargon that we use and keep it very straightforward and even keep the text as minimal as possible where everything was very precisely stated. So I think that was also a challenge for that book. Um, can you talk about your upcoming book, The Philosophy of Dumbness? Yeah, so I'm really excited about this book. It's a very different book than the other two. In many ways, so it started with this, this idea of, I was reflecting on this quote by Cedric Price, where it's, uh, technology is the answer, but what is the question? Or what was the question? And for me, you know, that's a quote that's used a lot. And, and then people would jump in and say, oh, this is the question, or this is the question. But for me, the first question was, well, what actually is technology? You know, what, what is that? We always think of technology as these high-tech things, you know, the, whatever it is, you know, uh, robotic fabrication or something. And, but when you look at the word technology, the root of it is techne, which is actually more about technique, craft, or calibration. And when you think about that, that's not necessarily uh, exclusive to high-tech at all. And then I started, you know, and then I, then I started going through a series of frameworks really questioning what technology is. And then I started questioning, you know, what essentially, so I, I was looking at, for instance, there was a, a conference at the Boston Architectural Center, now called the Boston Architectural College in the, in the 1960s, uh, 1964 to be exact. And they were projecting, you know, the question was, you know, how will the, how can the computer transform the, the future of architecture, the practice of architecture? And there were certain ones like, you know, Stephen Coons had this thing called the Sketchpad where essentially, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're drawing similar to what you draw on paper, but you're drawing digitally but, you know, on, this, uh, on this device. And then there was others like this, so this whole group at the Boeing company uh, that were doing works with mathematics and algorithms to generate entire geometries. And when I look at those two, they're both, we could say, high tech, but they're not, uh, as far as a way in which we think about it as an instrument to think with, they're not, they're very different. You know, it's drawing by hand or drawing on a tablet, for example, you're fundamentally still just drawing. And so the way we think through that tool is not so different. Well, if I said now we're not going to do that, but we're actually going to think through the device of mathematics or creating an algorithm to define a geometry, that's a really different framework of thinking. And that difference is what makes it actually an important as a new technique. And so, and again, so the book goes on and I, for that part of it, where I, I start to really question, well, what is actually intelligence after I look at what is that, you know, and, and so then I look at intelligence and say, well, actually, maybe in order for us to practice smarter, we actually have to be a little bit dumber. Uh, maybe we're making things more complicated than we need to. And so the first thing I say is uh, start simple. And so this idea that, you know, like if you were to look at uh, Joseph Albers studio, where, you know, in the Bauhaus, where they just drew a series of concentric circles. You look at that and you say, this is trivial, it's dumb. It's just some circles. But when you fold it with mountain and valleys, you get this amazing saddle geometry. So this thing that's something seemingly trivial is actually really ex extraordinary. Or like Gaudi hanging a chain or Heinz Esser hanging fabric upside down. I mean, there's, it's dumb. But when you flip it and you use it as a vault, it's really smart. But it's a technique that's, you could say is so dumb, anyone can do it. You follow the rules for hanging catenaries, anyone can design a vault that way. And so that's the beauty of it. The dumbness is actually the beauty of it, or the simplicity. And, and then another approach I, I call is irrational, or, or be irrational. And uh, this is kind of like, uh, you know, if you were to look at uh, the Farnsworth House by Mies van der Rohe, where instead of putting a column on top, or sorry, a beam on top of a column, you attach it at its side, well, that makes no sense. But once he does that, and you look at the building, the elements of the columns are objectified. It's almost like putting like, you know, when Marcel Duchamp, the artist, placed a urinal on a pedestal and we objectified that as something to appreciate or look at. Here, those columns are linear elements that we're almost looking at as works of art. And so really proliferating the, the tectonic. And so this is, you know, this idea of being irrational, that's kind of this idea that also architecture is an intellectual discourse that builds on itself. And then the third part of it is this, what I say, don't forget to forget. 
And, and this kind of goes back to this notion of, so a lot of AI in particular, it's a little bit of a critique of AI in that sense that a lot of AI, common sense reasoning, GANs, they work on this notion of memory and then they interpolate between that memory. So if I have a face here and a face here, they can interpolate variations between faces as an example. But I think it's actually just as important to forget as it is to remember. And this kind of gets into like the psychology of the child by Jean Piaget, where we're constantly reinterpreting the world we're looking at. You know, a circle and a square could be separate, but they could be the same shape to a child because they're both loops. And so I think, again, the notion of forgetting is also, or, or looking for the unexpected is just as important. So that's, that's the half, that's like the first part of the book. And then the last part, which is the most of the book, is instead of it being just that manifesto, which is what I did in the beginning, I then start to realize that a lot of times someone like myself will have these ideas, but actually a lot of people have similar ideas. They may or may not be articulating them the same way. And like, so for instance, in the 1940s and 1950s, architects, there was two architects who did houses with glass, that were essentially glass boxes. During the same time period, there was an artist who made you know, a, a music piece that was basically four minutes and 33 seconds of silence or background noise. And then there was another artist painting white on white canvas. So I mean, clearly that was something happening at that moment. It wasn't just one idea. And so I decided to ask a series of uh, well-known as well as emerging practitioners in architecture, design, and engineering, what is the dumbest but smartest thing you've done? And this was really this one simple dumb question you know, and then I had over 50 responses by these extraordinary individuals that were really wide ranging. But it, it became a way of not just understanding how to practice smartly dumb, but it actually became a lens to just understand the discourse of architecture. And so I think that, and then that's really the meat of the book is all these responses, not my intro that I was talking about so much before. And, I, and it also kind of challenges this notion of a manifesto being a singular voice and saying, it's actually more of an anti-manifesto. It's more of uh, it's really about the collective and, you know, whether or not they're all perfectly aligned doesn't matter. And each voice is you know, equally important. So anyway, each of each of these contributors has a spread where there's an image. It could be a photograph or a drawing. And then their response to that question what is the dumbest but smartest thing you've done. And, and I don't know, I think, you know, and, and there's a there's a wide range of contributors, you know, from, you know, extraordinary individuals like Cecil Baldwin to Stephen Hall to Marvin Blackwell, Nader Tirani. And, you know, it goes on and on. And it's just, you know, I, I think it's, I think that's, that's what I'm most excited to share is their voices in that book. Yep. It sounds quite interesting. I, if you can, can, can you share, is, was there a common pattern in those 50 responses, which you find when you ask that question? I think the, so I think the three themes I identified in the intro were, it seemed like most individuals connected with one of those. So like, you know, like someone like Nader Tehrani was talking about the irrational premise. He didn't call it irrational premise per se, but you know, it's really this idea. He talked about the Melbourne School of Architecture and Design, which he had designed with John Wardle, where roof became foundation to hang a space. And then, and then someone like Ben Van Berkel of UN Studio, he was talking about the Mercedes-Benz Museum, where the brief was to make a three-story structure where he proposed a, a I forget if it was six or eight stories, you know, within that three-story height limit. And so there was a completely irrational premise, but created everything as mezzanine. And he said that's how they start most of their projects. But then there were individuals who also were interested in just like, you know, like uh, Jürgen Mayer sent me a photograph of the interior of an envelope and said, you know, I opened an envelope and I saw a universe because he was, he was amazed or inspired by the pattern inside the envelope. So then it's really a very different thing. It's much more like this notion of, of expecting the unexpected or, or don't forget to forget. And there are some individuals who wrote about things that are more like that, where something that may seem obvious was not obvious, actually. And so I think there's, there's kind of a, a range, but I think most of them hit those three. Almost all except for a couple. Two of them talked about things that were a bit more of negative experiences in relationship to dumbness, where there were most, you know, where there was kind of misunderstandings and communication. That, that, um, but other than those two, everything else really looks at dumbness in a very positive way that you can use it as a design tool. And uh, yeah, I don't know, I think that's, that's kind of gives you a little bit of it. But I think those three in the beginning that I, the way I introduced it, and it was interesting because I wrote the intro before most of the submissions came in. So it's, uh, it's, it's, although there were some revisions, but so it's, it's interesting that 
how many of them still resonated with some aspect of that. What are some upcoming projects you're working on? So well, there's a couple projects or a few projects I'm working on. The one of them I've been doing for a while. I guess it's about a year now, a little bit over a year, is I've been collaborating with two research groups at the ETH in Zurich. And we've been working on ultra thin formwork for concrete. Uh, and we're in particular, uh, I'm doing the crease engineering and looking at how curved creases can be used to strengthen molds. And that's a really exciting project. It's not a project that's published yet, but it's, it's coming towards the end where we're getting ready to, to publish it. But essentially we're able to cast things, full scale concrete columns uh, with literally paper that's only half a millimeter in thickness. And so, I mean, that's like nothing. I mean, half a millimeter in thickness is, I mean, that's like as, as thin as a cover of a soft cover book. And it's all, a lot of it is done through kind of this idea of, of how we can understand controlled buckling and the bistable behavior of folding. And so, I mean, in a simple sense, buckling is normally really bad. But it, when you think about buckling going inward, where you're pouring concrete and the hydrostatic pressure is going out, that buckling can be used to resist that hydrostatic pressure of the concrete. And so there's this kind of beautiful expression. And then, and then once you pour it, the paper just peels off like a candy wrapper. So you get a super smooth finish. And uh, so there's this kind of beauty in the final column being not an expression of structural forces this way, but of actually of a structural geometry for a very strong formwork. And then another project I'm working on, which I'm working on by myself at Clemson University, is with using cables to make cable locking deployable structures with folding. So literally how things can self-deploy with the cables, but also as a way to essentially have the stresses distribute across the folded geometry evenly with the cables. And you can almost think of it as like a three-dimensional open web joist in some ways. So you have like, you have folds and you have cables. And, uh, and so that's a really exciting project, which I'm looking forward to sharing with people in the next six months. And then I guess the last thing is I have one more book that's in the works on the side, which is on unfolding polyhedra. And so as polyhedra shapes change, how does the unfolding change? And that's, that's also a project that's coming close to completion. And that's probably a bit more similar to like the morphing book, where I set up a series of strategies for how you can go about unfolding a you know, certain polyhedra. So yeah, a lot of things going on. I like to typically work on more than one project at the same time because it's fun to kind of bounce back and forth because then when you go back to a project, you look at it with a more fresh lens. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, According to you, what will be the future the of design look like? Design look like? Well, I think first off, I think there's a lot of futures. There's too many news articles that emphasize the future of architecture is this or the future is this. I don't, I, I, I like to emphasize that there's, I think there's low tech futures, there's high tech futures, there's all sorts of possibilities. And so I don't believe in like a zygous mentality that there's just one trajectory. But one thing I do think that is going to become, or at least for myself, and I think for a lot of people, more important is a certain level of ethics where, for example, we, I think it's imperative that we start to take seriously and develop methods to reduce the carbon footprint of how we build. And I think, you know, 40% of carbon or something around there is from the built environment. I think 80% of that is from concretes, or, or at least 80% of, of, of the material we use in building is concrete. And so there's a lot of things which we can do uh, to transform how we build and to better the environment. And, and there are, I think there's gonna be a lot more of that. I already see myself as well as a number of other individuals looking at things like, how do we design a better concrete slab? you know, where we reduce the material used in concrete slabs, or even just, a, you know, most buildings are columns and slabs, or how do we rethink that, you know? So someone like Philly Block is interested in shallow vaults as one example. And I think those are, you know, that's, you know, the work that they're doing there is, is extraordinary and as well as others, but it's really important. You know, shell structures are amazing, you know, they're beautiful, but most typologies are slabs and columns. And so if we can rethink something like that, we can better the environment. And so I think the more, yeah, I think there's just got to be more ethics and really being conscious about uh, how we build things and the whole life cycle of construction to demolition, which is something someone like Cedric Price was really interested in. He was interested in also the death of the building and how the building can be taken apart and recycled. But I think there's a lot more to that too. 
it's just a it's a big it's a big conversation. But I think that's definitely at least one aspect that I think I hope that more and more people will take seriously. Um, but there, but again, if you ask someone else, they might have ideas about urbanism and public space and so, you know social equity and all these other. And there's so there's a number of trajectories that are really important. But uh, for me, the the means and method of construction, or just because we can build, doesn't mean we should. That mindset is really important moving forward for myself. Mm-hmm. And achieving that uh, low carbon footprint design, will it through? Will it be through? Lo- low-tech or high-tech solution? I think it's going to be a combination. I think there's, I think there's all sorts of things that, that are possible. And so I don't think it's exclusively one or the other. I and mean, I don't think that it's necessarily, and even a technique that's developed, there might be a way of implementing it at a low-tech manner. That's where there's a lot of handcraft and there might be ways of implementing it in an automated manner. And, you know, I rem- there was a project which I, was, I, I got to go see during a barbecue, actually, that's extraordinary by uh, Fabio Gramazio and uh, Gramazio Kohler Research. And uh, he's, he's fabricating these amazing columns and essentially the garden of his home for a future house of his, that will, that will replace the house that's there. And he could have done it through automated manufacturing. And that would have been appropriate if he was doing a lot of them, a real lot of them for maybe it's a really large building or if it's to manufacture it. But since it was just for a residential project, he decided to do them in his own garden where literally using uh, simple jigs, he's able to bend wood and and, and still doing it computationally and parametrically with the way in which things are kind of pinched and controlling the radius of the arcs, but it's completely low tech. And so, so he's able to, you know, again, and it just, to him, it just made more sense for that particular project. It was there, you know, he's doing it on site, low means, doesn't have to deal with trucking, moving, transporting, and, and for the number of them, it just made sense. And so, I don't know, for me, that's super inspiring. I think I was super inspired by Fabio Gramazio with that because here's something that could be done fully automated and they have the ability and, the, and then here's something, and then here is the complete low-tech version of that where they're making these columns through bending wood, but still doing it computationally and numerically. And I don't know, I, I, I think that duality is, is the future or is a, an important future. Because there are parts, you know, there are times when we have machines accessible and there's times when we don't. And, and I don't know, and I think the idea that we can, if we make it more accessible, we can empower more people to change the world. Mm-hmm. Now we will move to our last section of this interview, which is about advice to students and young professionals. So, Mr. Joseph, what is the best advice you have received till date? When I was, I think it was when I was a second year undergraduate student, uh, a professor named Andrew Saunders told me, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. And I think it was such, and I think he said it to me again when I had him later in my undergraduate studies. But it's one of those things like, I don't know. It's like I need a a billboard or something on my forehead when I look in the mirror or something like that, because it really is important. And I think uh, early design students, a lot of times we have a habit of over-designing or we design or we don't get to the essence of the design. So then we start confusing with a lot of other stuff. And sometimes just keeping it simple is the best, is the best strategy. And then once you keep it simple, then you can figure out how to calibrate that to the, the, the best extreme you can. And uh, so I think that's probably the best advice someone gave me was just keep it simple, stupid, kiss. Mm-hmm. What will be your advice to students and professionals who are interested to do similar work? Well, I would say advice I give a lot of students or what I, and where I get most frustrated is when I see a student scratching their head and they're sitting at their desk and they're not sure what to do. And something I always tell them is, if you don't know what to do, do something. And that's it, you just do something. It doesn't matter what it is, but the act of literally doing will most likely yield an idea or something uh, that will, that it might be, might yield criteria for how you evaluate it. It doesn't matter what it will do, but I don't, again, I don't think you have to preconceive everything ahead of time. I think there's a lot that happens just through being open to explore, to see new possibilities, 
to be open to see things that you wouldn't expect. And, and tinkering, this idea of tinkering or playing with something. I think that's all uh, part of, of the way in which I work. Uh, and then when it starts to become research is when I'm actually using that design tinkering or playing to create new knowledge or to find new applications. Or when my evaluation criteria maybe has some kind of applied research performance to it, like ultra thin formworks where we're reducing the, the material waste of formworks. We're able to have surface finishes that are better than additive manufacturing. We're able to ship it without ruining the surface finish, you know, things like that. Or for a deployable structure, we're able to flat pack it and then deploy it with only a couple individuals. And then it's able to withstand a certain amount of structural loads. So there might be more engineering criteria, but on the other hand, there might be aesthetic criteria. Like, oh, a student might be interested in a jitter because you know they, they think that it creates a certain kind of dynamism, but also a certain kind of noise of a background rather than an emphasis on you know, the singular thing. You know, so I think there's, uh, or someone might be interested in thinness or where thinness has the illusion of being heavy and thick, but it's actually thin or, I don't know, there's so many different trajectories, but uh, I think it all starts, the best advice is just, if you don't know what to do, do something and then look at what you're doing and reflect on it and just keep going. Don't, don't think you have to be, have it all figured out in the beginning. Definitely don't. Mm -hmm. And what were some common skills you observed in students who produced outstanding work? I think the, I think the best students I've had, and I've had a lot of great students, are really the ones who are just not afraid of taking risks, not afraid of trying something new, and not afraid of failure. So many students are afraid of failing, uh, failing in quotes, you know, I mean, there's really nothing that's a failure. I mean, it's, you know, we're just, we're all just learning. But those who are really t willing to take big risks and try new things, I think that's the most best kind of students. And because uh, then they can, they'll, then they'll really dive into the pedagogy or the framework to the fullest. And it's kind of like I used to sometimes take students to uh, an art museum, like the High Museum in Atlanta. And my favorite response from some of the students was also the ones where the student would say, you know, I don't really know what I think of this. I'm just going to kind of soak it in a bit more. Not the ones who said I love it right away or I hate it right away, but the ones who just weren't sure and were just open to kind of experience longer and digest it. I think that's similar for like a really good designer. Someone who's just open to uh, whatever comes in the process and, and taking advantage of what they see. If they have too much of a preconceived idea, that's really hard. Then you gotta like break it like an egg or something. You know? But So try to kind of keep away some preconceived notions as much as possible. Can you recommend some tools, some tools resources, or conferences, or conferences to students and to young students professionals and young. who want to develop knowledge and skills which they could apply in their future design projects? That's a tough one because I think it really is so like, especially for conference or, or tools, it's tools can be anything. I mean, it could be a history book or it could be you know, learning how to program in Python. I mean, it, there's, a, there's a range of things that could be a tool. And so I think it would really depend on the student and talking one-on-one -on -one with that student, what uh, they're interested in. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think if, you know, if, if you're interested in, if you're interested in something like computation or design computation, which is more umbrella that a lot of my work falls under, then sure, then you, can, then you, you might wanna look at certain conferences like Arcadia, and uh, you might want to kind of understand certain trajectories that different individuals are looking at, whether it's machine learning or AI, or whether it's more of a, uh, a strength through, through geometry, structural design approach, or whether it's new materials and emerging technologies. You know, like there, there's a whole bunch of trajectories that you could kind of jump and dive into. And there probably are books for each of those. And then there's also like certain books, which I think like uh, Shape talking about seeing and doing or talking about seeing and doing by George Steine. I think that especially the chapter on embedding, I think that's something that anyone who's interested in computation should read because it, it really challenges uh, computation beyond what we normally think of. So for instance, George Steine, you know, one plus one could equal two. You know, if I draw a square or I draw a square, there's two squares, I see two, I drew two. But one plus one could also equal one. So if I drew one square on top of one square, I drew two and the computer sees two, but I only see one. So there's only one there actually. 
Or if I drew, if I did one plus one could equal three, if I have a square and a square where they overlap, there's a third square that results that we see in the middle between the two. So then there it's one plus one equals three. So it's, it's this notion that, you know, purely symbolic calculation like we compute is not the same as visual calculation like we see. And so there's, uh, once you understand that kind of as a base framework, it completely challenges some of the purely combinatorial computations that we're used to. I think that's a really, I don't know, that's just one of those reads that I think is appropriate for anybody. I also think cybernetics is a really, not enough people in the US especially read about cybernetics. And I think cybernetics is in many ways the theory of design. And I'm not the first person to say that. I think there's a lot of people. Like Heinz van Foyster writes about trying to have the most number of possible solutions. And there's also an amazing paper by someone named Ranoff Glanville called Researching Design and Designing Research, or it's Designing Research and Researching Design, one or the other, some one of the But there he talks about how design research is actually not different than scientific research. It's just scientific research is actually a subset of design research, which means at any moment during a design research project, you can adopt the scientific methodology. And we do it all the time. If I have a student make a series of models at the same scale with the same method, like let's say with paper, and that's like a science experiment. The only difference is we evaluate it differently because we're usually we're trying to figure out the right questions to ask and we're trying to identify criteria to evaluate. That's where it's most different is for us, a lot of the process is about figuring out the right questions. And, uh, but I think cybernetics is something that also a lot of uh, young architects interested in really anything history or computation could read. It also emphasizes this notion that Design is about conversations, but conversation between people, conversation between tools, or how parts of buildings have conversations with each other. And I think there's a certain emphasis on that that I think is really beautiful as well. And then maybe I'll just say one more thing about cybernetics, which is there's also this notion of you have a conversation, but then you have a reflection of that conversation. So this idea that you have kind of reflections upon reflections, or you kind of have a meta understanding of what had happened. And I think that's also a really beautiful part of uh, cybernetics as, under, as far as a theory of design. It really is what we do as designers. And so, yeah, so that's that. <laughs> <laughs> and personally, like I have faced I have this kind of this dilemma of, where, where there are always there are some kind of new technological advancement coming up and there are like theoretical books as well. So how does one balance learning new tools versus learning the knowledge of the theory part? Oh, that's a tough question. It's like, a, you know, I, I would say one of the things I would suggest is you have to, you can't be afraid to learn new tools, but on the other hand, you can't just jump to the new tool and say, that's it. You know, I know when I was younger and Grasshopper came out and everyone was jumping to Grasshopper, you would see hundreds and hundreds or maybe thousands of designs that had gradients. Suddenly everyone was doing gradients because it gave, it, you know, it, basically the tool pooped out gradients, you know. So it's, uh, you know, before people really understood how to make that tool dance. And uh, so I think there's a certain, I think you have to be cautious. You have to learn new schools, new, new, new tools, but you have to also kind of be aware of that every tool or framework has a particular bias and that bias will influence the set of possible results. And I think once you understand that, and I, that's something again, you know, in cybernetics they talk about, I think once you understand that, then when you do go into something new, you'll always be a little bit skeptical and tentative about it. And it's not that you don't want to learn it, but you'll try to be a, conscious of how it's influencing the way you think about the design. And I think as far as knowing theory before you know tools or vice versa, I don't think, you, I don't know, for me, I don't think you need to know the theory before you play with something. Sometimes not knowing the background can be helpful. So a certain kind of naivete can actually yield better results. So like when I was learning about math with my using design, I didn't jump and just read as many math books as I could. I could have done that, but I didn't. I understood math as a discourse and I understood how it builds on proofs. And I realized that I'm actually not interested in that. You know, I can prove that any shape or any design can be done. It doesn't teach me how to make any shape or make any design. So if I just try to make any shape or try to make any design, I might learn more. So some, some of it is just about kind of learning on your own through playing. And although that probably doesn't, that's probably not true for everything. Like again, for 
discourses like history and theory, that's a different kind of framework. Uh, but yeah, that's, I don't know, that would be my take is that there's definitely a certain amount of just learning on your own, not worrying about all the baggage associated with it. Yeah. Any question you never get asked but would like to answer? I don't know. I didn't think about this. I'm not sure. I think uh, maybe, I guess one way I might phrase it is sometimes, you know, students, and this is a question sometimes I ask students is, you know, you know, you're, if they're studying to become a designer, you know, I say, well, what, what is a designer? You know, what, what exactly is that? And sometimes, uh, or what is an architect? And sometimes students, or, or even what is architecture? Like these are some very basic fundamental questions that sometimes are really hard for people to understand, to define. And I don't know why they're always so hard to define. And so I guess I wouldn't mind answering some of those kind of questions because I think they can be a lot simpler to understand, to define. You know, like for me, architecture, yeah, part of architecture is about designing a place for people to inhabit. But part of it is also just that architecture is also semi-autonomous, meaning it's also just an intellectual discourse that builds on itself. So in order to make architecture, you must be having some contribution to something done in the past. And whether you do it consciously or kind of, you know, or kind of subconsciously, it doesn't matter. It's just there is this intellectual discourse that you're adding to. And it could relate for anything. It could relate to formal mechanisms or it could relate to more social political mechanisms. It doesn't, it could be, you know, more computational or more phenomenological. It doesn't really matter. They're all have their discourse. And I think the same thing for like design, you know, for me, one of the differences between a designer and an engineer, you know, there's certain engineers that I think are extraordinary, like Matsuro Sasaki or Cecil Bauman, but actually they both label themselves as designers, not engineers fundamentally. And I think the reason they do that is because uh, typically an engineer is thought of as someone who finds a solution to a problem or finds an optimized solution to a problem. And again, for me, optimization doesn't really exist. It only exists within a very specific framework, but a designer is fundamentally interested in finding the most number of possibilities. And so there it's all, it's kind of opening up possibilities rather than finding a deterministic one and maybe even sometimes creating problems for themselves that don't exist as a way to find other new trajectories. And so I think that's a, I don't know, that's a big part of being a designer versus being an engineer versus being a scientist where they're fundamentally about interested in creating knowledge. You know, so there's a certain, I think there's a difference there. Although we still do create knowledge, although we do still solve problems, again, we're trying to have a, you know, see a lot more options than normal. And uh, yeah, so I guess that would be a couple things. And again, for me, if I had to define architecture, architecture is architecture. I hate it when people say architecture is the science of this or the art of this or uh, something or a craft. It's architecture is its own discipline. I, I don't think, I think once we try to pretend like it's one of these other disciplines, we actually undermine the discipline itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How can our listeners follow you and your work? So I, I have an Instagram account called Joseph Choma Design. I post on there periodically different things I'm working on. And then and sometimes also occasionally I post some student work as well. I, I have a website, uh, designtopology.com. That's in the process of being completely revamped. So that'll be happening very soon. So that'll be uh, ready before the end of the summer. And so there'll be a lot of new work on there that people haven't seen. So I would say those are probably the two best. And I also have a, a Facebook page for Design Topology Lab. And so that's also under Design Topology. And there, there's like, a, I had just done a, a workshop with Digital Futures World. So all the recorded sessions for that Materializing Mathematics workshop is there. So there, there's might be a lot of other kind of uh, more pedagogical tools or workshops uh, that'll be posted. Again, just as a way to share knowledge. So. Yeah. Yeah, I have seen like, few lectures of that workshop and it was really useful so thanks a lot for sharing your knowledge oh it's my pleasure and uh, thanks for the interview it's been a lot of fun yeah i really appreciate it